Hey everyone, Dan here. Welcome to this week's episode of Fish. Before we get going, I just want to let you know about today's guest. Joining us this week, we were so excited to be joined by someone who is genuinely British nerd royalty. It is, of course, the lexicographer, the star of Dictionary Corner from Countdown, and 8 out of 10 cats does Countdown, and that is Susie Dent. Now, Susie Dent is someone that we, you know, we basically monitor her Twitter account on a 24-hour basis. Uh, she's just always pumping out incredible words with these definitions and you've never heard them before and we've never met her before so this was such an exciting moment for us not only to be able to meet her in person have a nice chat but also to sit down with her on stage in front of a crowd and dork out with her so uh yeah i really hope you enjoy the episode we absolutely loved it and outside of that, I just want to quickly mention that you need to get your hands on Susie's two new upcoming books. The first one comes out September 28th, and that one is called Interesting Stories About Curious Words. So it's sort of all those phrases that we know, stealing thunder, red herrings, but what do they actually mean? So this book is going to be looking into all those phrases and terms on your behalf so that you now know who was Sweet Fanny Adams, or why are circles vicious? All those questions that you might have had She's put it into an ultimate compendium to explain it all. So that's out September 28th. Uh, but then on the 5th of October, she also has a book coming out called Roots of Happiness, 100 Words for Joy and Hope. And that is a book for kids. Basically, Susie had the idea when looking through a dictionary that there's far too many negative words in there and that we should be highlighting the more happy ones, the more uplifting ones. So reading directly from a blurb here, it's going to lift you out of your mubble fubbles, which is a slightly sad mood, make you grin like a giggle mug which is someone who never stops smiling, and have you feeling for blissed, extremely happy. So do pick up both of those books, but until then, enjoy Susie here, live at the Soho Theatre, with no such thing as a fish. On with the show. Hello. Welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast, this week coming to you live from the Soho Theatre in London! Hi. My name is Dan Schreiber, I'm sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray, and Susie Dent, and once again we have gathered round our microphones with our four favourite facts from the last seven days, and in no particular order, here we go! Starting with fact number one, and that is Susie. Okay. Samuel Johnson, in his Dictionary of the English Language from 1755, decided that he would not include any words beginning with the letter X because he said, thus begins no word in the English language. <laughs> wow. That's my fact. And is that true? Were we xylophoneless at this point? Yeah, xylophone we... was a century later. But also he was quite picky. You know how lexicographers today, we are really careful about not giving any opinion whatsoever. Even with words like trumpariness, which are my favourite, meaning something completely showy but utterly worthless, we're not allowed to say <laughs> anything. Uh, but he was notoriously rude to the Scots, you know, about the Americans. Um, so I think he probably didn't have much truck with anything from Greek. Okay, yeah. right. But we did have X words at the time. We had a few X words, but a lot of them came later. Lovely words, all from Greek, like xenium, which is a gift to strangers, uh, which mm. I think is really nice. But what was lovely is that it came from the Phoenicians and they had a letter Samek, which actually gave the letter S, we think. But that meant fish. So you could say there's no such thing as an X. Oh, oh that's that's cool. nice. well, that's the title of the episode. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the quickest we've ever got our title yeah. as well? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Wow. Did they have xenophobe in those days? They have a xenophobe. Uh, xenophobia, I think it, most phobias are based on Greek, but we kind of made them up a little bit later, sure. but we based them on classical things. Like coolrophobia, fear of clowns, which mm. I have. They didn't have clowns in ancient Greece, so they chose the word for stilt walker. Oh, um, yeah, it's quite cool. Wow. What's your um, and are you also afraid of them because of, of the sort of knock on? But still, well, no, I like stilts. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, clowns definitely not. Really? No. Mm. Have, have you seen the new? Is it the Smiler? The horror? No. No. Okay, don't. <laughs> Uh, the reason um, I ask about xenophobia is because yeah. Johnson, as you say, probably didn't like the Scots very much. No, Maybe didn't the like Americans. the Americans. Yeah. Didn't like the French, for True. sure. 
Uh, he predicted that he'd write the dictionary in three years. Mm -hmm. And then when someone pointed out that it had taken the French 40 years <laughs> to write their own dictionary, he said, well, this is proportion. 40 times 40 is 1,600. As 3 to 1,600, so is the proportion of an Englishman to a Frenchman. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. So 42,000 words made it into this first dictionary that he did write. 42,000 yeah. definitions. And um, he had self-deprecating jokes that he kind of included in there, which is quite fun. Oh, so, yeah, the, yeah, the word uh, for dull, the description for the word dull, he explained, to make dictionaries is dull work as part of his oh, yeah. description. <laughs> And then uh, also the definition of lexicographer. Uh, he wrote a writer of dictionaries, a harmless, harmless drudge. drudge. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, you know it by heart. Yeah. <laughs> Susie, I that's do. incredible. Um, and also he was quite, he, he would never admit that he didn't know a word, right. uh, which was quite funny. Huh. So, or the, or the origin of a word. So um, spider, I loved, he couldn't quite get to the root of spider. So he just said, is this not the insect that spies from a door? Oh. Uh, so that's and everyone said, it came from. it's not an insect, mate. Yeah. It's oh. an arachnid. <laughs> exactly. It feels like such a, the, like the any old bollocks era of, of study. <laughs> just feels like such a great time to be alive. Yeah. Well, Dan, kept... Dan, you would have absolutely I would have been thrived. king. I would have been king back then, yeah. yeah. That is true. He was one of the last people in England to be touched for scrofula. Oh, yeah. Oh. So cool. So That's if you such had... a horrible word, scrofula. Scrofula, yeah. And he, it was just a skin condition, and um, the monarch would touch people and, and effectively cure them, ineffectively cure them of scrofula. <laughs> and Sammy Johnson's parents took him to London from his hometown when he was three years old. You know, your local parish would maybe club together, raise the money, they'd send you off, and the queen, the monarch would touch you. It'd be big, big cues as well, right? Huge like, cues. Yeah. Charles II, I think, we might have mentioned this before, he touched something like 2% of the population of England. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Steady. It was uh, a different yeah. time, wasn't it? It was a, different it was a, it was a very, very different time. time. <laughs> and, um, and, like, and, and Johnson had a, he had a gold coin. So which queen Anne, the, yeah. the touch piece, which is the sort of, yeah. It's it cool. didn't work, though. And actually, no. he's quite... Disfigured his face through scrofula, which is yeah. very sad. Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah and well, there's some really weird but lovely etymologies in there. Uh, so tarantula is an insect, insect, he does say call it an insect again, uh, whose bite can only be cured by music because it was thought it could be cured by the tarantella, oh, the dance. Wow. Um, was that proper doctor's advice at the time? Yeah, or was that, that was the belief. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Is there a doctor in the house, Dr. Johnson? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Get a hurdy-gurdy to this woman now. <laughs> Um, and then he had retromingency, which means pissing backwards. That's how he defined it. Um, when you say pissing that? backwards, you don't mean sucking it up into your body. Right? Oh. oh. I think is that it's possible? Like, I hope mean, not. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like some animals, their penis points backwards, right? Oh. I think. And so a retromingent mammal oh, it you pisses know. on the back of its feet. Oh. Is that right? I think. This is a bit like Roy Keane saying, shove it up your bollocks. He's like, <laughs> shove it up your bollocks. Um, but it does feel sometimes when you need to pee and you don't want to, that the hold has a suck action to it as well. <laughs> <laughs> does, does it? Am I alone here in that? I think, rather think you might be alone. No, 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 in that. but properly think about it. You're oh, kind of oh. like, I really need to pee, and you're going, you're doing, you are, I am. Oh. I am. <laughs> There's a word for that as well. If you are holding on so tight, it's piss you pressed. And what does, it's oh, that's just the act. That means desperate, it's used of horses mostly. So it's kind you, of desperate to pee, but holding it in. Piss you crest. Piss you press. It's like oh. piss suppressed. Ah, ah kind of that's cool. But don't do it, Dan, because Tinko Brahe <laughs> supposedly died from doing that, didn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. He was supposedly. at a dinner. And he was, yeah, a famous astronomer, and he, he was at a dinner and he was too polite. Yeah, and his bladder exploded. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So don't do that, Dan. And, well, he, I imagine Johnson would have had to pee a lot because supposedly he could drink in one sitting 25 cups of tea in one go. No. He loved his tea. He loved his food. Boswell wrote about this. Boswell would say that to watch him eat was like watching the most intense thing ever. He would not have any conversation. He was just rampaging through his food. The <laughs> veins on his head were like pulsating. <laughs> he was just a man obsessed with needing to get the... And he did that with reading as well. He would, he would just have to read really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and and 25 cups of tea is what I read as well. Wow. wow. That is amazing. Yeah. He lived at the same time as Francis Gross, who really was gross by figure. Yeah, right. So Johnson always chose the classical references for his dictionary. Um, so he was quite a purist originally anyway. Um, and then Francis Gross went to, to the brothels and the taverns and picked up all the street slang. 
And I don't know if they ever met. Right. They were, oh. you know, but they would have had a good dinner party. <laughs> they would have known about each other, do they you definitely, think? I think they would, yeah. yeah. So while he's yeah. sort of harmlessly drudging away, he's thinking of this other guy who's going having to the fun. <laughs> and having fun, yeah. yeah. Must have been terrible. Yeah. I like some of his definitions. Um, so the word etch is a country word of which I know not the meaning. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. The word defluxion, uh, the definition is a defluxion. <laughs> That's a real Friday afternoon word, isn't it? <laughs> I gotta get to the brothel. I just so, put any else. Stuff. 25 cups of tea waiting just across the room. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Um, a sock, something put between the foot and the shoe. It's good. Yeah. Uh, lunch, is this is good. Lunch, as much food as one's hand can hold. Oh, ah, there is yeah. a word for that a galpen and a yepsen. So a galpen is as much as you can hold in, in a single hand. Hmm. Um, which, and I think. Yep, yes, and it's two hands. So biscuits, good for biscuit measurements, mm. I think. Mm. That's brilliant. Um, I've got a couple of X word things. Oh, yes. oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, the word X-ray. Do you know what the X in X-ray stands for? Unknown? Just unknown, just mm. X. He didn't know what it was. I'm just going to put ah. X here for now, and when they work out what it is, we can change yeah, it, and yeah, it just yeah. hasn't been changed. Um, It'd be called Röntgen rays. That would be a nightmare. Is that who... It was Charles Röntgen, he was called from Germany, wasn't yeah. he? So, yeah, Röntgen rays. Röntgen rays. Röntgen rays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you know this one. Uh, the X-Men. Why are they called the X-Men? Oh, I have no idea. Is it because they spend all their time on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. It, yeah. Well, I, I thought it was because Professor X, Professor Xavier, oh, yeah. Professor X, X, X the X-Men. Yeah. yeah, but no, it's um, it's extra power, which was said in a comic book. Oh, um, really? Yeah. And um, just while we're, if you insist, we continue on X-Men, uh, <laughs> just <laughs> discovered an amazing character from X-Men today oh that I've never heard of before. So did you know that there's a character in X-Men called Forget Me Not? Oh, no, okay. I didn't no, know that. you don't the because they don't either. Because if if he is out of your sight, no one can remember him. Amazing. Aww. So the first time we meet him is someone from X Men going, "Hey, how you doing?" And he's like, "I've been here six years, and no one can remember this guy." It's and Aww. it's, but that's, it's a, a, that's a great superpower. Not if you want to be part of the team. <laughs> yeah, but for robbing a bank, yeah, you go in, you rob a bank, you leave. That's true. They yeah. just carry on with their day. I think that's a really good superpower. I think the superheroes generally aren't robbing the banks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But Professor yeah. X, the only reason he knew he existed because he set uh, like an uh, alarm on his iPhone or whatever to remind him every so often, like, forget me or not, it's a character in, in our comic book. That's oh, okay, fair. cool. So that Wait, was the only... Professor X isn't aware that it's a comic book that he's taking part <laughs> no, in. I was, I was just, yeah, I was, I was leaving. The, I broke the fourth wall there for him. Um, anyway. Maybe you can. I don't know. All right. That's, thanks um, for letting me get that out. I've got another X for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, X when you watch things like at not the normal speed. Like one point times two times one yeah, point exactly. five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, does, just a quick show of like whoops. Who here regularly watches things sped up? <laughs> Who regularly listens to podcasts sped up? <laughs> Who okay, listens? that's really interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know our voices are probably like, why are they talking so slow on stage? <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode. Yeah. What? Does anyone listen to our podcast sped up? <laughs> slow down. Slow it down. Slow it down. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, guys, do you follow an etiquette for your exes on messages? Because I was having this conversation with the brilliant Greg Jenner, the historian. Oh, yeah. And so he said X um, has only just been kind of okay in the last 10 years to yeah. put on a platonic text, you know, between friends. Mm. XX oh, yeah, yeah. is more romantic. Yeah. And he would never put three Xs. And, he, and I said, why? I put three Xs to my best friend all the time. He looked up on his phone, all porn. I didn't realise. <laughs> Did you realise that? Three X's? No, just that might be saying X's. something about Greg's phone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. no the three interesting X's thing about, means love, right? Yeah, you think well, so. But the interesting so. thing about that is the first use we have of adding X for kisses or yeah. a greeting like that um, is from 1763, and they did seven X's. Oh, wow. That's a lot, isn't it, to just go straight in with seven. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, that's intense. Yeah. That's yeah. huge. Ah, According to the OED. Like a yeah. Christian X. Well, okay. yeah, they think that it was like a blessing, right? Because yeah. it was like the yeah. cross. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Oh, I heard, well, this is in relation to X rated, that it was based mm. on the skull and crossbones, maybe. Oh, really? Yeah. It was exclusively films which featured pirate activity. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. Do you know why Blue Joke is called Blue? Is it? Sorry? Do you know why Blue Joke is Blue? Uh, no. No. 
Because censors used to have a blue pencil and also um, oh. sex workers in prison had to wear blue gowns. Oh, in, really? Yeah. That's great. Blue gowns? Blue gowns, yeah. Oh, wait, sorry, are they, are, they the, are they prisoners in this? In prisoners, Sorry, yeah. I yeah, thought they were, like, uniform. visiting... Blue uniforms. Uniforms. Got it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they weren't. <laughs> sorry, they yeah. were frilly things. Imagine you've got to visit your friend and like, sorry, we've run out of the white for visitors. Do you mind wearing blue, Andy, while you... <laughs> no problem. <laughs> what a visit I've had. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> Um, no, we just lost the cocaine. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Too much? <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Stop the podcast. Stop the podcast. Hi, everybody. Just wanted to let you know we are sponsored this week by LinkedIn Jobs. Ten years ago, we were doing our, our three-person podcast. Me, James here, and Anna. And um, we were going nowhere. And, uh, and then we, we hired a little little guy called Dan Shriver, and everything changed. Yes, uh, but don't make the mistakes that we did. Instead, <laughs> go to LinkedIn Jobs, because LinkedIn is the place to find the right people for your team. It's the place to find them faster, and it's a place to find them for free. What you do is you add your job to your LinkedIn, and then you add a purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile, and everyone can see at just a glance that you're the kind of person who's looking for a new hire. That's right. There are screening questions. There are all sorts of simple tools that make it easier to focus on the candidates with the right skills. Maybe they can pronounce words correctly. Maybe they check their facts. Maybe they don't believe in the Loch Ness Monster. So find the qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster by posting your job for free at linkedin.com forward slash fish. That's right. Just go to linkedin.com slash fish and you will be able to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Okay, on with the podcast. On with the show. It is time for fact number two, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in 1986, a group of maths teachers organized a protest in Washington, D.C. against the use of calculators in schools. Their protest failed because they couldn't get the numbers. That felt a bit ironic. <laughs> At that moment, you became a dad. <laughs> um, uh, that's such a good fact. Yeah, I just thought maybe time for a numbers round, see the Susie's oh, here. Oh, yeah. yeah. I bet you're the first the person top. to make that connection since 1986. I bet no one. I, I bet no one even did at the time as well. Do you not think? Well, it was a ma- wasn't it a maths? It was a gathering of six thousand maths teachers that they were at protesting yeah, about calculators. It, it wasn't a massive story in the newspapers, <laughs> I must admit. Um, but it was in the newspapers, and like you say, it was the National Council of Teachers uh, of Mathematics. So they were all maths teachers. There were six thousand of them there, and there were about fifteen of them, we think, who had <laughs> placards and songs, and they were protesting against calculolics. Uh, because they thought that these kids, because they were using calculators, they wouldn't be able to do normal maths. They would just kind of rely on them and they wouldn't be able to do any kind of multiplication or anything like that. Yeah, right. It was a simpler time, wasn't it? It was. Oh, no, our kids and their screens. What sort of terrible stuff are they doing? <laughs> Typing in boobs upside down. <laughs> Was a more innocent time. Um, yeah, yeah their, their slogans are amazing. The button's nothing till the brain's trained. And um, <laughs> they chanted, calculators later, we shall not be moved. Calculators later is good. There yeah. was, um, they interviewed them in the newspaper I was reading. Um, they interviewed the leader, John Saxon, um, who organized this whole thing. And they said, well, Mr. Saxon, why are there no teachers? You know, why have you only got 15 people? And he said, teachers don't like to demonstrate because they are shy. Ah. <laughs> Fair enough. I guess a mental arithmetic is is an important thing. I read something about yeah. you, Susie. I want to know if this is something you still do. But oh. according to an interview you gave, every <laughs> single morning you do your 75 times table. Um, I think I was being a little bit whimsical. Um, <laughs> no, it's because for a very, very long time, if 75 came up on the countdown board, yeah. I just gave up. Because I can't do... 575s, I have to write it down. I don't know what it is. And the more Mm. I struggled with it, the worse it got because I became fixated on it. So that was probably where it came from. I don't know why. It's stupid. It's not Uh, your job to get the the numbers, though, is it? Like, you can just let Rachel do all that stuff. No, no, I really do try. And she's very good at giving lots of different tips. 375. (laughs) 
Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well done. Yeah. What you can't yeah. see at home is Andy's got a calculator under <laughs> the table. Yeah, and that we've edited this. That took him 15 minutes to yeah. get to it. The guy who listens to it slowed down is not going to get to it for half an hour. <laughs> But um, I love all those old calculating methods because calculate is from calculus little pebble because they counted with yeah. stones. Um, and then they had abacuses, didn't they? It is a political and hot potato, though. Like it is, calculator? It is a, well, yeah. So, for example, um, does it harm whether you can do mental arithmetic if you use a calculator all the time, in your opinion? Yes, probably. OK, well, you're, you're in good company because in t 2011 there was a British MP who led cons like public concerns on this and said, I would describe this country as in love with the calculator from a very early age and said that too easy access to calculators is available in local schools. Oh, and that wow. MP, Liz Truss. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whose command of like, large numbers is unparalleled. <laughs> So, Susie, you're a great company. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. Lovely. That reminds me of the petition so. to um, get rid of all French words from the British passport. And uh, it went online and got quite a few signatures <laughs> without realising that passport is French. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Most of the words on there were French. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Hiding to nothing, I think. Um, human calculators are amazing. People who can do incredible you yeah, know, sums in their yeah. head. So, um, there was, I was reading a, an interview with the 2020 world champion who is an Indian guy who's called Nilakantha Banu Prakash. And he got to it uh, quite an interesting way. He was confined to bed as a child for a year. And loads of people who are amazing at mental maths have either been confined to bed or they've been mm. in solitary confinement or like something's happened where they've lived in their imagination for a long time. Um, so all the way through school, he would spend six to seven hours a day practicing mental arithmetic, just doing that. Um, when he was interviewed by the BBC, Throughout the interview, he recited his 48 times table. And when he's wow. talking to someone, he will count how many times they blink just to keep uh. himself engaged in the conversation. Wow. wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That's cool. Yeah, there's been loads of them over there. In fact, one of the things that you have to do if Guinness want to find out if you're the fastest at working things out is they'll give you a 100-digit number and ask you to work out the 13th route. So the square root is two things that you times together to get to that number. So imagine then a cube root is three things you multiply together to get to that number. You have to go all the way down to 13. So it might be 37 times 37 times 37 times 37, 13 times. The answer to the power of 13 is the number they give you in the first place. Is That's the, right. Is the question. I'll be honest, I don't <laughs> think you're going to trouble the Guinness World Cards people. <laughs> even, even you describing this has put me into a sort of defensive <laughs> crouch. <laughs> Position. Okay, so the 30th route. I was, okay. Yeah, and I was reading about a guy called Vim Klein, um, who was the record holder. Uh, this was in the 80s. Well, he must be still quite close. Uh, he managed to do it in 1 minute 28 seconds. But his tactic was to mutter in Dutch while he was doing the calculations, and he would only mutter swear words. <laughs> so if, imagine I'm Dutch, he'd be like, fucking hell, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> And they go, uh, 263, and it would be right every single time. But there is there's so much science behind swearing, lowering your cortisol levels and raising your serotonin levels. And, you know, that oh. experiment where you dip your arm in ice-cold water and yes. you can hold in twice as long if you're shouting bollocks than if you're shouting bus. Um, <laughs> so, it, and there's what lalochesia is exactly it. So, so that's what he was doing. Wow, that's so it works. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Would it help doing this podcast if I just said bollocks all the way through? Because that's what Dan's been doing for the last 10 years. <laughs> oh. You wouldn't say that if we lived in the time of Samuel Johnson, mate. <laughs> um, here's the thing you have to do at the Mental Calculation World Cup. Just another example of what... So, the calendar... There's the calendar round. This is an exciting round. You get given a list of dates from 1600 to 2100, the years, yep. and you're given 60 seconds to name the day of the week that every one of those oh. dates huh. happened on. Oh. Okay, so you get, a, right, you get a minute to do it, okay? Yep. And, and this great long list of, of um, days, like 24th of February, yeah, great. 1603. Monday. Right, okay. <laughs> you're going to say Monday to all of them, aren't you? <laughs> well, have you got the answers? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's pointless okay, I quiz. Can't, I can't disprove that it was a Monday, but the point might... <laughs> oh, my God, that's so like... The, um, the point. Well done, Dan. No, no, no. He, didn't, he, didn't, he may have got it right. That's yeah. true. But what I'm saying is... Next people, question. No, okay. There are people who can do it even more effectively than just randomly guessing <laughs> incredibly rapidly. So the record, the record winner in 2012 was someone called Nafumi Ogasawara. Okay, they got 57 in a minute. Wow. One per were they second. All, they weren't all Monday, though, were they? 
They were all Monday. <laughs> that was the trick that year. Yeah, yeah. That is amazing. Isn't that a little, what That's is incredible. That's going down the list. Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Saturday. That's I think there are tricks, aren't there? There are. It out. Really? I've, I've, I've met so. someone who can do that. It takes them a tiny bit longer, obviously, but we're talking about it's a like champion, a champion here. Yeah, 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 but you can say any day and they go uh, that and they work it out. Quite. There are tricks. You can marker history in certain ways to get you to that day. What? Well, like what? I don't know. Like a civil war broke out on a Wednesday. <laughs> Therefore, yeah, three and a half years earlier. Who knows, yeah. Uh, but there was, when there used to be people who would go on stage and you would ask them to multiply two numbers together and they'd just be able to do it, and that would be their whole act. It's pretty good. It's pretty cool, And it's verifiable it? for everyone in the crowd as well. That's true. But that's, that's good, but that's, oh no, because if you've got someone on stage who's doing the sum while they do it, then yeah, that's, and then but they, they would be able to be Yeah, but they would be able to do it much quicker than that, for yeah. sure. But so you're right, it would be quite unverifiable. But the tricks that they used to use, basically there's loads of math tricks like you would see on Countdown. It's like your nine times table is one way of doing it, or removing things or adding things to 100, all these different tricks they have. But the way that they would mostly do it is someone would ask you to multiply this by this, and then you would go, okay, what were they again? And you keep stalling oh, a few times, but it. you're already doing it in your head. And then you would <laughs> multiply all the numbers. And if I multiply two numbers, I would always start from the digits and work my way up to the highest number. But they would always start with the highest number. They might say 17 million, and they're working out the next ones as they go along, but they haven't even God. got there yet. Wow. And so That's they really would be impressive. able to say, like, I can answer the question immediately but actually they're kind of working it out as they went along. Amazing. That's it's pretty so clever, cool. isn't it? Yeah. I once got brought up to the front of my school uh, when I was a teenager in high school and told on the spot, Daniel has achieved the top percentage of people in New South Wales, Australia for mathematics in the recent exam that we took as part of the thing. And it was a multiple choice what? exam. Oh, no. Yeah. Was it, was everyone's Monday, was Monday, 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 Monday. Monday, Monday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I literally guessed every single answer because I knew nothing about <laughs> mathematics. And I just happened through fluke to get it right. Come and on. I still have a certificate at home for being one of the <laughs> greatest mathematicians in New South Wales of my period. Well, they, yeah. did, they, did they sort of say, well, this is great because we, we've been wanting to put someone they up for knew, the junior they professor? They fucking knew. <laughs> Come on, Dan. And you'll get your big old award. I was like, I was an idiot. They, they, <laughs> no, it was, it was humiliating. Um, <laughs> still got the certificate. Um, That's so amazing. Good. Yeah, it is fascinating watching Countdown, and I know that you're saying that you you like to do it as well. But watching mm. Rachel be able to get to those sums is She's it incredible. does feel like magic, doesn't it? When yeah, you see it, it really does. Yeah, the camera crew who've been with us for such a long time as well. They're also very nerdy. So they give nods of approval for two things. One is when I ever mention an orphaned negative, which is when you have things like really gruntled, shoveled, well, shoveled doesn't exist, but um, ruthful, gormful, stuff like that. Whenever I mention okay. orphan negative, they go. And whenever Rachel says, yes, that's the sum of two primes, she'll the, we just go, wow. yes. Oh, wow. That is how <laughs> geeky we are. Do the cameramen like play along with the game, do you think? I think they do, yeah. yeah. I think lots of camera women as well, but they're all brilliant. Oh, of and course. um <laughs> sorry. Yeah, James. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't ticking you off there. Um, but yeah, I reckon they do. I reckon they do. Quite a lot of them get the conundrum. Uh, Not so. the women though. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are more often than you would think. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I got a quick yeah. protest thing, another protest thing oh, yeah. to just chuck in. Oh, yeah. quickly. Is it the protest waiting for James outside the hood? <laughs> <laughs> camera folk Sorry. of the world. It's just we do. We have so many camera women, it would be really bad of me not to mention that. But it, I honestly wasn't having a dig. <laughs> They're called cinematographers, James. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, I, so the thing I want to mention about protests is one of my favorite things I've learned recently. In 1966, the Procrastinators Club of America held a protest against the War of 1812. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> they made signs and everything. They were protesting it. And um, the, the club newsletter that came out after it announced that the protest had in fact been a success because a treaty has now been signed. <laughs> so <laughs> good on them. That's so good. <laughs> uh, okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is Andy. 
My fact is that for 30 years, Tibetan Buddhists have been saving fish from certain death and releasing them back into nature. Unfortunately, it turns out they have unwittingly been feeding them all straight to the local otters. <laughs> so there's this ritual called Fang Sheng. It's very, it's very, you know, ancient traditional thing. You do it's called like life release is what it means. You you get animals that were destined for slaughter, and um, and you sort of. You, you free them, and you, it's your way of like paying a debt back to the universe. It's that kind of thing. And since the 1990s, there are lots of Buddhists in Tibet have been buying up fish from fish markets, uh, live ones, and uh, releasing them into local rivers. Thousands of them every year. Um, and unfortunately, there's a recent scientific report which has looked at the, the state of the nearby rivers because... I mean, it's not a great thing to do in terms of ecology. You know, lots of that's a really invasive species risk, and it'll completely like mess up the local ecosystem. Anyway, turns out that there are almost no fish left in the rivers, and oh. the otter feces are <laughs> full of the fish that have been released wow. into the rivers. So they have been kind of helping yeah. nature in a way, in that they've like a lot of very very fat, happy otters <laughs> uh, on this river. Yeah, but that, and the otters are stopping the the non-native fish from destroying the ecosystem. So in many ways, it's a happy story. But not for them. If, if they realised what they'd been doing, right? No, no, no. Nor for the fish that get uh, released, yeah. confused, and immediately... And no yeah. karma for the Buddhists, or what do you reckon? It's above my pay grade, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a German word for this, which is, I don't wonder if you've heard it, Susie, is uh, Verschlimmbesserung. Verschlimmbesserung, yeah. yeah. And the definition... It's an attempted improvement that makes things worse. Yeah, oh, that's great. Oh, that's yeah, a great that's a word. One. God, I can't believe you just knew that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did oh, see you peek at my notes here, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't, she didn't. No, she didn't, she didn't. Uh, but yeah, now there's this whole um, industry, isn't there, of people capturing animals so that they can then be released, Yeah, I think. And obviously it is quite bad in lots of places. And they looked in Singapore and in Southeast Asia and they're just finding all of these lizards and stuff which shouldn't be there, and yet they are. Yeah. And so the Singapore Buddhist Federation is saying that maybe you should just maybe just not eat meat instead. Oh, yeah. Or uh, give some money to animal shelters. Yeah. Just anything other than doing this thing which is inherently quite bad. It's slightly, it does it's slightly mess things up. But there, is, like, there yeah. is something to be said there about if you go to a restaurant, I speak as a veggie here, but you go to a restaurant and you see a tank full of lobsters. I mean, that's just, I would do anything to rescue those things. Yeah. I probably yeah. would go and dump them in the local loch. Yeah. <laughs> I can see no, why. I, see I can see why no, they No, I do. definitely understand it, yeah. yeah, for sure. You get, um, in Shanghai, what happens is that, again, when, it, when the, uh, the people turn up to carry out the Fang Sheng ritual, uh, a lot of people turn up selling them live turtles at very inflated prices. So already, like, they, they've created a secondary market in turtles at this point. Yeah. Uh, but then there are also fishermen waiting down... Sorry, fisher folk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anglers um, <laughs> waiting with nets, but literally 20 metres away. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It creates a lot of... Uh, it's, an in it's interesting from an economics point of view. Yeah, but also, like, the temple ponds tend mm. to be full of turtles because people just shove loads and loads of them in, and obviously right. you can only have so many turtles living in a pond before they have uh, a bad time of it. Yeah. So right. these fish were carp, weren't they? Uh, yes, yes, they will have been, yeah. Why do you Sorry, ask? I, know, I was just sitting in there that I went thinking, why do we carp on about something and whether that's got anything to do with the oh. fish? But I know that is from a Latin word meaning to pull to pieces. Likewise, carpet is sort of like tufts that you kind of pull. But I don't think it's got anything to do with fish. What about... Not um, carp do we say that? Carp, carp I thought it was harp on. on. You can harp on as well. So what's harping on versus carping? Harping is just same endlessly thing. playing the same note on a harp. Oh, right. And to carp on is to criticise and just kind of constantly... Have a go. Stop carping, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I think it's got an issue with the fish. I've got a question. Yes. Is carp pulling something apart related mm. to carpal tunnel syndrome, the ah. wrist condition? Mm. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. Oh, maybe. I don't know is the answer. That's right. a very good one. Yeah. I think it is related oh, yeah. to, to <laughs> carping. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, my favourite fish is the cod. Oh, yeah. Because cod meant scrotum, and the fish is supposed to look... Sorry, sorry, James. <laughs> I'm about what? to take a, a bit of your beer. Oh, I'll have the haddock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so. um, it's because it looks like a bag, apparently, the fish. What? Yeah. And a cod piece really? was a piece for your scrotum. And brackets go back to a Spanish word meaning cod piece because they're a bit of support. So architectural oh. brackets, but also they kind of support a bit of your sentence. 
That's oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not that lovely, Andy. I don't know <laughs> if you heard the start of the scrotal. I know it's scrotal, but that's not. I think that's nice that you yeah. think of your scrotum as a sort of set of brackets. Yes. So, <laughs> gently supporting uh, uh, the things that need. To be... <laughs> Keep going. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. But it's a weird, weird oh, word, otherwise, isn't it? Cod piece. Cod yeah. piece. Yeah. Maybe, I've thought about that. I wonder yeah. if you, what if you cod someone because a cod is a practical joke as well, isn't it? Is oh, it like, well, like yeah. I'm kidding, but I'm not. I'm codding. Yeah, I'm codding. Yeah, codding. Uh, I wonder really? if that's got anything to do with you talking balls or something. I don't know. <laughs> what, what I'm else so is sorry it? I brought this tone. No, no, no. I just, <laughs> I've never heard of carping. I've never heard of codding. I've never heard of codding either, no. Yeah. To cod. To cod someone. I think it might, it might be Irish. I'm not sure. And oh. cod's wallop is completely different. We're learning a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> that's anyway, amazing. Let's not get into cod's wallop. Oh. <laughs> Um, do you know um, Gary Larson, The Far Side? Yeah. The comic yeah. books. He he was someone who was also into saving animals and, and sort of oh, yeah. playing around. So when he, was a, when he was a cartoonist in his early days, he was being paid, but it wasn't a lot of money, so he needed to get a secondary job. So he applied to be an animal cruelty investigator for okay. the Seattle Humane Society. Um, but he never ended up doing the job because in the car on the way to the interview, he hit a dog. And so oh, no. he thought that's a bad start. Oh, um, no. The dog was fine, but he didn't end up doing it oh, as a result. Gosh. Yeah. I was reading a bit about um, reintroductions, you know, because this is about oh, reintrodu yeah. reintroducing an animal, maybe where it should be, maybe it shouldn't. And, you know, like Britain is, um, is uh, kicking off beaver reintroductions, which is very exciting because uh, they. they Oh, beavers are a bit controversial, but basically they do do a lot of good in a lot of places. They create wetlands, and wetlands store carbon, and they're more resistant to fire, and, you know, they're, they're, they're very endangered. Like, the wetlands themselves are endangered. Beavers help bring them back. Um, so this year, North London got two beavers called Sigourney Beaver and Justin Beaver. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, <laughs> Did we literally only get two because they were the only puns we could think of? <laughs> I think so, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> That's how they're sort of coming back. But anyway, like I say, it has caused some controversy. So there was a headline from the Daily Mail earlier this year. Could rewilding animals turn Britain into a modern-day Jurassic Park? <laughs> oh, <laughs> With yeah. beavers. Well, firstly, exactly, yeah, beavers. And secondly, Jurassic Park is set in the modern day. Oh, here we go. <laughs> ah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sloppy headline writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a problem in America, you know, when if you go to the coast, often there are baby turtles that are born and you, they might wander into the city because they see the lights. Yeah. You often get people going to the beach and they see these turtles and put them in, into the water. But the problem is that in those areas, especially around Florida, there's also a lot of tortoises around there. And people oh, don't God. know the difference between oh, turtles God. and tortoises. Yeah. <laughs> one difference being that one can swim and one can't oh, swim. No! <laughs> So, number one, don't go around grabbing turtles anyway, because, you know, there are people who will do it who know what they're doing. Sure. Yeah. But secondly, tortoises have toes. Oh. That's, that's the way to tell. Oh, that's good. Public service. D turtles, turtles have flippers. Have flippers. 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 Uh, you got it. Because they like them, swimming. Let's call them to turtles. Oh, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> it helped me. <laughs> don't touch that. It's a totoral. <laughs> it's hard to say. <laughs> That's probably why it didn't happen. Loads, there's loads of red kites near me, though. Red kites they've really done well with. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And the kite that we play with is from the bird hovering. That's so nice. Yeah, they're, yeah, but they're beautiful. Are, they're they're really gorgeous. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They've, done, they've done amazingly. They're at, um, all, everywhere. Wildcats yeah. might get new wildcats oh. in Devon and Cornwall. This is exciting. Right. And you don't need permission to introduce them because there are already a few in Scotland. So if something, okay. is, if something is non-existent in the UK, like a wolf, then you need permission from uh, the environment secretary, and very boringly, they are not allowing us to have wolves everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so wildcat. could you and I yeah. just yeah. drive up to Scotland, grab a few wildcats, drive down and just set them free? Um, <laughs> uh, like, it doesn't sound like it's allowed. It would be allowed, would it? it, I think like it feels that would like be a hell of a car ride. <laughs> 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 the thing is, we both have electric cars as well, so we'd oh, have yeah. to stop about five times <laughs> before we get there. Um, I don't know if it would, and I'm, I'm sorry to rain on your parade, James, oh, but the sorry. problem is the wildcats in Scotland, they get described as functionally extinct. So this is weird. They're real, they exist, but they're also extinct because they, there are a few hundred of them left only, and basically they spend all their time oh. shagging domestic cats <laughs> to the extent that the gene pool is just completely... <laughs> 
<laughs> like scientists have studied lots and lots of dead cats from about the last hundred years, and they found that, that you need a particular kind. Like wild cats are quite a specific thing, but they're right. they're randy, and they will just. Wow. But wait, you so know. to wild cat, are they really vicious wild cats, or are they I, just I, quite cute? A bit of a bit of a loaded way of describing them. They're just doing. Well, what I don't they know. Do. I don't know what. No, wild no, but I assume they are. Think, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. They're not. Uh, they're not massive either. They're sort of two cats. Uh, the size of two cats, I would say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Roughly a cat and a half, two That's... cats. That, <laughs> they're not. They're not. I, okay. I don't think they are. No, no, no. As in, they very rarely take uh, human young. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, domestic cats are quite vicious, aren't they? They kill yeah. a lot of birds and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. That's a good point. And yeah. I think wild cats are quite similar. I just think it must be a pretty exciting day if you're uh, just a normal domestic cat <laughs> and a wild <laughs> cat comes in town. <laughs> ah, that wild. It'd be Must like be. John Travolta and Olivia Newton John, wouldn't it? It would just be like the leather bound dude yeah. walking in. It must be like if a Yeti was to approach you and have sex with you, Dan. <laughs> Because it's bigger, it's hairier. hairier. It's like it's a slightly different species, but still recognisably humanoid. Yeah, <laughs> and it's on. And yeah. it's on. Yeah, <laughs> and it's. <laughs> My wife and I have an agreement. We are <laughs> completely monogamous. She's Apart got a list Yeti. of celebs. Yeah. She's, She's got, got like Yeti, John yeah. Hamm, yeah. yeah. got... Yeti, and Brian Blessed. Those are the two <laughs> that make it in. Oh. It is time for our final fact of the show, and that is my fact. My fact this week is mathematician David Cox has two things named after him, a geometric coordinate ring and an algorithm that he invented with Stephen Zucker. They are known as the Cox ring <laughs> and the Cox Zucker machine. <laughs> so <laughs> what's particularly exciting about this is that in the 1970s, Cox and Zucker met each other and went, oh, we've got to write a paper. <laughs> the invention came after the juvenile dream of having a Cox Zucker paper. Yeah. So then the, um, these things, the coordinate rings and algorithms, as the greatest mathematician New South Wales has ever produced. <laughs> <laughs> Could you explain perhaps what they are? Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, I would, James. Because <laughs> I have a maths degree and I fucking can't. Yeah. Is, it, is it complicated? I really, really tried. I really tried yeah. to understand it. When I say really tried, I just knew I was going to throw it to James. And if he can't understand <laughs> it, I feel fine. Wow. Um, it's, uh, yeah, no, it is, it is really, really complicated. The second <laughs> thing that he invented was not an invention. It was attributed to him uh, by two other students because he was the inspiration for it. So the Cox um, ring was uh, inspired by right. his earlier work. And they thought, let's play into the gag here. But they came up with it and then they named it after Yeah, so and, they, and it's just this wonderful thing about academics having a sense of humour. This is something, this is interesting. There's a thing called Stigler's Law of Eponymy, right? And what it states is that no scientific discovery is actually named after the person who discovered it in the first place. So like Pythagoras' theorem... Named after Pythagoras, not discovered by him. Uh, Halley didn't discover Halley's Comet. It had been known about a bit earlier. And so this is the Stigler Law of Economy, and it was coined by a sociologist who was called Robert Merton. <laughs> 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 who named it after someone else, yeah. And these, these two guys, when they did this, by the way, they were studying at Princeton University. So the reason I came across this fact is because I found out that you studied at Princeton University. Yeah. Oh. You studied German there. I know, I'm weird. No, that's that's very cool. Did was you it, meet was it a good, Zucker? Was it a good there? degree or was it a Verschlim No, it was uh, no, it was brilliant. Oh, uh, nice. I mean, German is just so it just gets given such a hard rap, and it is honestly the most lyrical, beautiful. We we're just used to people shouting orders in war films, but it is really, really beautiful. But then people always say, "Why isn't there a word for this in English?" And then they will always say, "Well, I bet there's one in German," and um, and there usually is because it is quite like Lego, isn't it? You can just Pile. Do, do, yeah. Have you ever had Ben Schott on your no, show? No, love to. He wrote this brilliant book called Schottenfreude, which um, was basically finding as many gaps in English as he could find and then getting a German translator to um, make up a word. And my favourite one was um, Deppenfahrerbeugung, which is the compulsion to stare at the person you're overtaking in your car. Which <laughs> <laughs> is <was> perfect. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's really good. Yeah, well, that was, that was him. It was very good. These people, Cox and Zucker, uh, <laughs> I was looking at some of the people with similar kind of names that are, what would you call that, double barrel names. Yeah. If you go on the internet, you can find loads of examples of people who got married and had quite unfortunate names. 
I'm not sure all of them are true, but I have looked at them all in the newspaper archives and found some that are definitely are true. Okay. And I'm going to do a little quiz. See if you can... <laughs> I'm going to tell you the name of one of the people in this relationship and you can see if you can guess the name of the person they married. Oh, <laughs> so, okay. This is an easy one. Elizabeth MacDonald. Um, uh, John, John Haddafarm. <laughs> E-I-E-I, -E -E -I, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you the phone? No. Um, uh, 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 Dan, you can get this. Wait, so say again. Elizabeth MacDonald married... And, oh, oh, and they double-barreled the names. Yeah. Uh, Takeaway? Burger? Uh, Burger! Uh, Joel oh, Burger. Yeah. Very they nice. didn't necessarily always double-barrel, but when you have the newspaper things, it says this person married this person. Amazing. They call it the uh, okay. McDonald Burger Wedding. Beautiful. Brilliant. Okay, Brilliant. so... Okay. Um, okay. I can pull this back. You've got it, right. <laughs> you can do this, Andy. Amy Wide. 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 Oh, yeah. W-H-Y-D-E. Um, uh, Stephen Birth? Fanny. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. Birth? Birth is good. Birth. Martin would birth. Be, that would be great. Uh, you were closest. It was Alexander Hole. Hey! So, ah. <laughs> Amy and Alexander White Hole. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, Gosh. <laughs> Joe Looney. Joe, what, Looney? Looney. Oh. Tune. Uh, Judy Tooney. Tune. <laughs> <laughs> ben? Ben, no. Tune. Close. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, a normal uh, um, surname. Matthew Tick. Looney Tick. Looney Tick, very good. Shelby Ward. Looney Ward. Oh, gosh. Uh, and one final one. Okay. Uh, Teresa, come on. Uh, Michael England? <laughs> <laughs> That's Tim, uh, Michael Tim. Come on, uh, Tim. Come on, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Arnold Mabak. <laughs> Down. Come on down. Okay. Uh, Come on. So, Mr. I Eileen, David yeah. Eileen. No. <laughs> oh. um, Anyone in the audience? No. It was <laughs> Teresa Come On and Frankie Topamy. Ah. <laughs> oh, and I should also say that I was reading the Reddit of uh, Jill Stein, you know, the Green Party leader in America. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and she did an AMA, so it was like, ask her anything. And the second most popular question they asked Jill Stein was, Dr. Stein, have you ever thought about marrying Senator Al Franken and hyphenating your last name? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's so good. Um, there's only one street uh, in the world named after John Major, and he didn't know it was named after him, and no one told him they were naming it after him. Right. Aww. It was going to be Sir John Major Close, which sounds menacing. Um, <laughs> But it's, but it's going to be called Sir John Major Close. But then the London Fire Brigade said, well, that's a bit complicated. We might get confused if someone rings up and says, so they just called it Major Close. They just cut out the Sir John. <laughs> and then oh. when, when, when he was asked about it, he said, I think it's most unlikely they'd name a street after me. And he just hadn't been told. No one informed him. Oh. Margaret Thatcher has loads of stuff. Named. Margaret Thatcher has a peninsula named after her. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> That's quite interesting because in <laughs> Europe, for every 10 streets that are named after a man, yeah. um, there's only one named after a woman. It's ah. much more likely that you would be named after a man which, if you're a street. Which woman is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, interestingly, okay, yeah. taking that in mind, yeah. the most popular person in European streets' names is a woman. So oh, can okay. you guess who it is? In Virgin Mary. Elizabeth. Yeah. Elizabeth? No, Elizabeth. Andy's right, it is the Virgin Mary. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. right. In Europe, of course, so lots of yeah, yeah. You know, Catholic yeah. countries and stuff. Yeah. Do they actually have Virgin in the names or is it just No, Mary? it's usually just Mary, Mary Road. Maria. Yeah, and it's usually named after the church. Yeah. You know, yeah. It goes to, so yeah. Or Santa get... Maria. Santa Maria. Which I would argue is named after Santa and the Virgin <laughs> Mary. <laughs> so we should lob those off her numbers. Um, <laughs> That was a dumb fucking joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> love it, love it. And tawdry that... is another religious one. That is an eponym because tawdry comes, you know, if something's tawdry, it's really shoddy. And that goes back to St. Audrey. So she was um, uh, an abbess um, and a, eventually a saint. And she wore lots of kind of necklaces in her youth. And then as a nun, she got uh, throat cancer. And she thought this was revenge because she would just so wear such wore, frippery. Wow. But anyway, lace, such as the one that she wore around her 
neck was sold at fairs and it was St. Audrey Lace. Oh, and then that's it became brilliant. Tawdry Lace, yeah. What was it about being 55 minutes into this show that made oh, you think of the word Tawdry? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing. <laughs> no, it's the religious, the religious side of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the Chippendales, the dance troupe? Yeah. Oh, yes. You know what they're named after? The, the, the Thomas? Alvin and, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, I was thinking of Thomas Ch Chippendale, the person who made all the furniture. Oh. I was thinking of the children's cartoon. Like, Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> That one, you know. Me, I James, is, James is right. James is right. I'm just going to put you out of your misery. James is right. <laughs> they were named after the furniture in the club where they performed. That's which ah. was design, it designed to look like classic oh. Thomas Chippendale furniture. <laughs> ah. Because they were kind of, you know, like muscular. I guess they were sort of muscular and, and you know, impressive ah. looking. So were the chairs. Oh, I think they do sit on stage and you, you sit on their laps, right? Surely oh, not. do you? I think so. Wait, have they become the chairs? I think so, that's what I'm saying. They are. Oh, don't pretend. Oh, oh I think... Um... <laughs> this is from the man who suggested they... come on my back a few minutes <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was looking into just a scientist who have humour. I, I like it when it makes it into a paper, and I just found a couple of papers that have been published that I really like the titles of. So a couple of them, here they are. The Mouth, the Anus, and the Blastopore. Open questions about questionable openings. Very <laughs> um, good. Another paper, The Effects of Having Christmas Dinner with In-Laws on Gut Microbiota <laughs> Composition. <laughs> And then the third one, head and neck injury risks in heavy metal, headbangers stuck between rock and a hard bass. Oh. That's Brilliant. a good one. Um, I'm going to have to wrap us up. Oh. That's it, guys. We've I, got to the end. I was just yeah. looking at very unintentionally, like unintentional, because this is about something where it was intentionally very rude. Yeah. And I was trying to find examples of things that were unintentionally rude. Okay. I've just like a couple of very tiny quick ones. So, uh, Yolo Williams, Welsh naturalist, okay. uh, was okay. co presenter on uh, Spring Watch. Uh, in 2016, he was uh, discussing diving seabirds with uh, a female conservationist, and they watched one plunge into the water in front of them, and he just turned to her and said, so, is that the deepest chag you've ever had? <laughs> <laughs> and she got to say, no, we have had deeper than that. <laughs> and we've, I feel like we should end with it. I mean, I, like, I think some of you will have heard this before, I know. The, the all-time classic Harry Carpenter, after the boat race, 1977, was reporting it live on TV and said... Ah, oh, isn't that nice? The wife of the Cambridge president is kissing the cocks of the Oxford crew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Can I just do one more? I know yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really good, but uh, in 2012, Pfizer, the drug company, came up with a new drug for osteoarthritis in dogs called Rimadyl. Uh, and okay. I went on to the newspaper archives for the adverts for this. This is genuinely true. There was an advert that said, Pfizer Animal Health, the manufacturers of Rimadyl, have launched a program available only through veterinary hospitals. Register online at rimadog.com. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that is it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you would like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said on this show, we can be found on whatever the fuck he's decided to call it this week. Uh, but for now, I'm calling it Twitter. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And Susie. At Susie underscore Dent. Yeah, or you can go to our group account, which is at no such thing, or you could go to our website, no such thing as a fish.com. All of our previous episodes are up there. Um, you can also find links to Club Fish, which is the secret members club. Any Club Fish members in the crowd tonight? Yeah. There we go. There's the six of them. And uh, <laughs> so do join that. It's really, really fun. Check out all the merch, check out everything else. We'll be back again next week with another episode. Soho Theatre, thank you so much. That was awesome. Say thank you to Susie Dent, and we'll see you again next time. Goodbye.